like lightheadedness and stuff a little bit. Yeah. But um go ahead, Steve. Most precious Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for another day that we can come together and study your word, dear Lord. We pray that you would lead and guide and direct in our study. We pray that you would give us wisdom on reading books from the the man that was known for wisdom himself. So I pray you open our hearts and minds to what you have to hear from your word this morning. And dear Lord, we want to lift up um, Vale and Katie. Um, they're both Katie recovering from surgery and just trying to get back into things and still dealing with back pain. And I just pray that you help her healing process move along. And we also want to lift up Veil, dear Lord, that she's struggling with this awful shingles and mm -hmm. the pain that it entails and keeps her bound in her house. And that you would just be there with her, dear Lord, that you would, as um, Shannon just pointed out, that we thank you that you bore everything on the cross for us that we will ever go through. And so we can take comfort in knowing that as well. And I just pray you give her quick healing that um, the neuropathy in her hands and feet would subside as well, dear Lord, as her body heals from this shingles. And you would give her immune system a boost mm -hmm. so that it could fight this off and get her better quickly. I pray for um, those that can't be with us today, dear Lord, for whatever reason that you would be with them wherever they are as well. And I pray you be with Shannon as she shares with us this morning. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sue. Um, Juanita said she had to take her son to for cataract surgery, so she may not make it. But um, <clears throat> okay, so Song of Solomon, Song of Songs has a like a, a personal like I have a personal story with this book. Um, have any of y'all heard of the Tommy Nelson Song of Solomon? anyone no okay so song of, tommy nelson has done this song of solomon conference it's it's like a lot of it has um to do with uh like uh like relationships and he uses this book to um with relationships it's actually a really good study and if you i don't know if he's i meant to look at it look into it this morning but i was lazy this morning and well i, I well anyway i just didn't have time um, and so I, but at this conference, um, me, so whenever me and Shannon were dating, my husband's name is Shannon for everyone that's new. So I'm not talking about myself. Um, so whenever we were dating, I went to a different Sunday school class than him. Um, and this, my Sunday school class at the time was going to go to this conference. It was in Kentucky and, um, it, it was a bunch of single moms and some, a few guys and, so we had to do it really on the download because we were all poor. And so we kind of like, we're like, okay, we can do this, but we have to like bunk together and all the girls all in, you know, so at any rate, it was a really fun trip. But as we were going down there, me and Shannon were looking at the calendar and we noticed that uh, seven two, which is the day that we started dating was on a Saturday that year. And so we were kind of like, well, could we get married a year to the date that we started dating? I mean, we knew God called us to be together and so at any rate, all of us say, I told Shannon, I'm going to go on this, this conference this, in Kentucky. And he was like, okay, you know, no worries. Well, the, he was on staff at the church that we were at and, um, the, he was in the, he was in charge of the college and career ministry. And so the lady who was in charge of that, of that, like was his boss, I guess. Um, she had went to him and said, Hey, have you seen this church? We're kind of wanting to get a feel for it. Would you ever be interested in going to it? And he looked and it was actually the church at the Song of Solomon conference was going to be at. And so he was like, well, I guess I'm, he said, that's just crazy because Shannon's Sunday school class is going. I'll just kind of tag along with them, um, get a feel. So it was kind of like a, like a work thing for him in a sense. So he, he went with us. And as we were down there, that's whenever we looked at the date and we saw, well, then we went to the Song of Solomon conference, which I highly recommend. It was an awesome, Tommy Nelson is hilarious. He is hilarious. So he takes these passages and makes them very, very R-rated. <laughs> and so, but he, it is, he's really good though, because it's about marriage. It's about, you know, and that's what this is about. This book is about, um, any rate at the conference, he said, I really feel like if you know that you're with the person God intended you to be with a year to the time you started dating is a great time to get married. And we were just like, no, well, I guess we're getting married seven two. So we uh, confirmed it and I found my dress that weekend and I didn't tell my best friend at the time. 
Um, so anyway, it was a really cool, um, God wink for us. That whole weekend was a God wink. Everything about it was awesome. Um, so this going into this book, I just always remember that. And, um, actually Song of Solomon, uh, four, seven is on my ring. Um, the Proverbs was on Shannon's and then, um, Proverbs or Song of Solomon, our Song of Songs four, seven is on his or on mine. Um, so we're going to do an overview because I don't know about y'all, but I really struggle with um, Solomon having this because of so many wives and concubines. And so as I'm reading this, I'm like, every time I read it, it just frustrates me because I'm like, he had this kind of love and yet that wasn't good enough. So I kind of did some digging because I was just kind of really struggling with it. I found some really interesting perspectives. Um, some people will say, um, you're going to hear different perspectives. Some people say this is Christ in the church. Um, and some people will say this is not Christ in the church. It just depends on who you talk to. Um, for me, I'm just like, read it for what it is. Um, I'm not going to go to my grave. Um, I'm, I'm just not one of those people who are like, it has to be this way or that way. Um, I think as long as we're glorifying Christ, that's all that matters. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from this. This is a really good book about marriage. It is about like, we are going to see how a marriage should be and how a relationship should be, um, how God created it to be. So I'm going to do the who, what, where, and why. Um, so Solomon wrote this, but it has been debated. Um, I can understand this because of Solomon's many wives and concubines. And so um, I do think that he wrote it, but it has been debated. Um, just a few, I've read a few places on that. And so uh, another common objection to Solomon's authorship is the king's well-known possession of 700 wives and 300 concubines. How could a man who lived like that write a song about devotion to one woman? It appears he could do so only because grace touched his heart. In this respect, he foreshadowed other biblical writers who, except for God's grace and calling, were the least qualified to write scripture. For example, Paul, the great apostle, wrote many eloquently of, uh, eloquently of grace and his unworthiness. And we see that in 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 16. Solomon was a man immersed in power and pleasure, but God opened his eyes to true love. Solomon also authored the book of Proverbs, just as he did not always follow the precepts he recorded there. So too, he evidently co composed a great love song despite his failure to live in accordance with its ideals. And I think yesterday, I can't remember, I think maybe Teresa had said in the um, no, to do as I say, not as I do type thing. And that's kind of like what I think of with <laughs> some Solomon. I'm like, yeah, he had it, you know, but it's just like, you know, you think of some pastors who aren't really believers, but they're pastors and they're preaching God's word, but yet they don't have a relationship with God. You know I mean? They're able to still preach and tell others about God, but they don't have a relationship. Um, so Solomon had a lot of wisdom and knowledge as he prayed and, and this as well. Um, so what what did Solomon write here? Um, the central theme of Song of Songs is a celebration of goodness and beauty of romantic love. The song's romantic ideals are as captivating as imagery, emotional intimacy, sensitive communication, delightful sexuality, profound companionship, common perspective, willing forgiveness, respect, integrity, security, love's devotion through bleak seasons of winter, and love's renewal and new seasons of spring. Since the song portrays a perfect love, it is natural for a songwriter to compare it to the love of God for Israel. Solomon's love is like God's love for his people, and the Shulamites' love is like a response for those people to God. If the New Testament will later tell us that a man's love for his wife should emulate Christ's love for his bride, Solomon's song shows such a marriage pattern for divine love. Since the song captures ideal love and it's a reflection of God's love for Israel, its romance also reflects the ideal love that God intended for a husband and wife. We see a return to paradise and a courtship that blossomed in an uncluttered beauty of nature in a wedding night consummated with allusion to the garden of paradise and in a marriage that delights in innocent lovemaking. The song's last um, praise of love captured all of this. The flames of love are like the fire of the Lord. In Genesis, God ruled over the waters and chaos to make the heavens and earth <clears throat> creating in his image, Adam and Eve to reflect his love and their union. In Exodus, God ruled over the deathly waters of the Red Sea to establish a new a nation for his people. And since God's love is like fire, and since the love of Solomon Shalomite whew, recovers the innocence of Adam and Eve and reflects God's love for Israel, the song compares the power of romantic love to the eternal fire of God that no waters or rivers can quench. That's one perspective. 
Um, and so the fullness of the union that takes place at marriage is described in some of the most splendid poetic language in the entire Bible. In a word where so many speak of God's special gifts with coldly clinical and apathetic um, statistical language, the passion of Solomon's poetry refreshes a worldly thirsty for truth about marriage. Solomon began his rendering of his this relationship with two lovers in courtship, longing for affection while expressing their love for one another. Eventually, they come together in marriage, the groom extolling his bride's beauty before they consummate their relationship. And then finally, she struggles with the fear of separation while he reassures his bride of his affection for her. All of this reinforces the theme of goodness of marriage. Some suggest the book also pictures in a more general way Christ's love for his bride, the church. Um, here's another perspective from MacArthur. The song has, um, oh wait, that was, sorry, that was, uh, let's see, is this one from MacArthur? I think it is. The song has suffered strained interpretations over the centuries by those who use the allegorical method of interpretation, claiming that this song has no actual historical basis, but rather that it depicts God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church. The misleading idea from hymnology that Christ is the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley results from this method. The typology variation admits the historical reality, but concludes that it ultimately pictures Christ's bridegroom love for his bride, the church. A more satisfying way to approach Sol Solomon's song is to take it as face value and interpret it in the normal historical sense, understanding the frequent use of poetic imagery to deflect um, reality. To do so understands that Solomon recounts one, his own days of courtship, two, the early days of first marriage, followed by three, the maturing of the royal couple through the good and bad days of life. The Song of Solomon expands on ancient marriage instructions of Genesis 2.24, thus providing spiritual music for a lifetime of marital harmony. It is given by God to demonstrate his intentions for romance and loveliness of marriage, the most precious of human relations, the grace of life. Um, and did I put that in there? I didn't. So that's just from 1 Peter 3.7. Okay, I'm going to read this one, and then we're going to kind of talk about a little um, about what I just read. Um so does this claim have any weight? The Song of Solomon written by King Solomon really teach sexual immorality. There's some, this was some, there is a few things that hadn't suggested that. Like if you look before marriage, before chapter five, there was some like physicalness, but it doesn't teach that. You know, whenever you're dating, when think about whenever you were dating, if you're not married or you know, even when you, if you've ever been married, Think about that time of passion where you just really wanted that person, but you knew you couldn't because love waits. You know, we have to wait um, if we did choose to wait. And we're going to talk about that later because, um, you know, not everyone waits and, and that, and you, you, but that, but here, it, this is not teaching sexual immorality. And there are some people that think it is. Um, and then King Solomon did engage in sexual immorality later in his life, considering he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. But the Bible tells us these women turned his heart away from the Lord and caused him to worship other gods. God's his immorality and vast number of marriages certainly didn't honor the Lord, nor are they upheld as a good example for us. Rather, they are his downfall and God judged him for it. But this happened later in his life, long after Song of Solom Solomon was written or Song of Solomon was written. Um, OK, so on that, do you all have anything on that? Is there just something that y'all are like, yeah, I feel like um it should be Christ in the church. I personally think that it's just about a couple that are married. I think God is giving us an example in this, in here about a couple, a marriage. Um, and, and I feel like the church doesn't ever talk about sex. Therefore people, it's just never mentioned. And because of that, it's like a bad thing. Um, I've counseled for many, many years at a, um, at a choose life. And it's just like, whenever I tell the people like God created sex and it's good, but it's in, it's good inside of what his creation was inside of marriage. And outside of that is not, I mean, it's, it's, it's not as enjoyable outside because you have that guilt that comes in the shame that comes with it. But inside of marriage, you don't have that because you enjoy it. God created it. It is good. And so that is just something I feel like is missing in the church. Um, to just mention, hey, it's good. It's okay. You know, it's okay to enjoy in, in marriage. And I think that's what the Tommy Nelson Song of Solomon conference is, why it's so good, because that's all he talks about is inside of marriage. This is what this means. This is how you relate to your spouse. This is how um, men are. This is how women are. And it just, it's a really good conference. But does anybody have anything on that? I'm going to get some water. So somebody talk. This morning, I decided to watch the um, 
overview that somebody had posted on Digging Deep that I don't remember the case that does that. But their take is that Song of Song, that it's written in the like spirit of Solomon's wisdom, but it's not necessarily by him, which I thought was interesting because I've always been, I don't know, you guys talked about struggling with other books of the Bible. I really struggle with Song of Solomon. <laughs> I grew up very conservative, very, very, very conservative. And I just, I struggle with this and I'm like, I don't get it. I don't understand this weird imagery, <laughs> whatever. So this is my struggle here. Yeah. To say that enjoying this book is, I, it's probably my least favorite book to do. And I told my husband that last night and I was like, I'm just ready to be done with Song of Solomon. I'm, I'm, I'm actually ready to be done with Solomon. I mean, I'm really just ready to just move on to Isaiah. That's my personal take. I, I mean, I know, uh, yeah, but it, it's God's word. He has it. But I think that at the end of the day, I think we read into things too much on that. And that's why we just read it for face value. Um, and I think that's what John MacArthur was kind of saying. I, I liked his take on it because he's like, just read it for what it is. Like, don't make it something it's not. And I think we kind of do that with um, God's word sometimes. Well, it's the definition of interpretation. Interpretation is taking your own thoughts and feelings and projecting it upon whatever you're looking at. You know, kind of the, you can't relate to it. Like, yeah, just each time you've said 700 wives and 300 concubines, I'm just sitting here going, ladies, how would that feel to be one of 700 or one of 300 to, yeah, no, no. It just, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, it, I, and it will, it would, it's in a parallel it it, may, it reminded me of kind of society in general now is there is no commitment of marriage there is no commitment period so it's like well wait a minute maybe he was on to something because that seems to be like the general rule nowadays and you know how everything I don't know I guess I was raised completely old school but it's like I don't know I just like sit there nowadays and it's like people like wonder understand they wonder why, oh, my relationship's not working out. Well, you guys aren't even committed to each other. So why would they treat you better than, you know, a concubine? Because let's call it what it is, because that's essentially what you are. Sorry. But it, like I said, it just mystifies me that how long ago this took place. Well, hey, you could just fast forward to 2023 and it still applies. So I don't know. Okay. And for, for me, one of two wives would be too much. <laughs> okay, so we'll go, we'll just continue. Um, when was this written? 970 BC. Um, okay, so this was something I have never thought about. And I kind of, I told my husband about it. And he's like, you make sure when you read this, you have to make sure and say this is a theory. So I am really interested on in what y'all think of this. But who got uh first kings three one? Amanda, do you mind reading that, please? Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, by marrying Pharaoh's daughter daughter. Solomon brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace, the Lord's temple, and the walls surrounding it. Okay, so <clears throat> make sure there's not anything else that needs to be read. Solomon's second wife was the daughter of Pharaoh in 1 Kings 3, 1, that Amanda just read. They may have married about three years into Solomon's reign. If that marriage took place immediately after the events described in 1 Kings 2, 39-46, 20 years into his reign, after Solomon had finished his palace in the Lord's temple, he built a palace at Gezar for the daughter of Pharaoh, his wife. Solomon was still serving the Lord at this point, verse 25. First Kings 10, King Solomon is visited by Queen of Sheba and almost immediately afterwards begins multiplying more golden riches as well as gathering chariots and horses, even from Egypt, um, accumulate, accumulating excessive wealth and horses and acquiring those horses from Egypt was forbidden for it, kings of Israel in Deuteronomy 17, 14 through 7. So how, can somebody read the Deuteronomy verse, please? Go ahead and read, yeah, just read 17, 14 through 17, Katie, please. Okay. 
And the 10, just go ahead and read both of them actually, the 10, okay. seven. When you enter the land, which the Lord your God gives you and you possess it and live in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations who are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses one from among your countrymen. You shall set as a king over yourselves. You may not put a foreigner over yourselves who is not your countryman. Moreover, he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor shall he cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never again return that way. He shall not multiply wives for himself or else his heart will turn away nor shall he greatly increase silver and gold for himself. And then 10, 7 through 9. From there, they set out to Gugoda, and from Gugoda to Jotbatha, a land of brooks of water. At that time, the Lord set apart the tribe of Levi to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord to serve him and to bless his name until this day. Therefore, Levi does not have a portion of inheritance with his brothers, the Lord is his inheritance, just as the Lord your God spoke to him. Okay, so we see Israel's kings were instructed not to accumulate wives, Deuteronomy 17, 17. And then after Solomon accrued excessive wealth and horses, it should not come as a surprise that 1 Kings 11 begins, but King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonites, and Hittites. This passage, the first place, um, the first place Solomon is described as loving many women records that his love for other women was in addition to his love for the daughter of Pharaoh, signifying her priority to them in both time and prestige. So it appears that Solomon started multiplying wives after Pharaoh's daughter moved to Gazar and after the visit by the Queen of Sheba. If this is the proper way to understand the narrative, Solomon was faithful to his wife for several years before he became entangled with many foreign wives who led him away from the Lord into idolatry. Um, and so I thought that was really interesting and we're going to keep, we're going to go back to that, but uh, I'm going to read the contribution to the Bible. A beautiful love song inspires us like grace creating within us a desire for its beauty. Like such an enchanting love song, Solomon's song inspires a pursuit of the love it portrays. This romantic delight is not a modern fairy tale or fantasy from the past, but reflects God's desire to form within us a pure and devoted love. We discover that there is a bliss in married life that is reflective of the greater love believers experience as the bride of Christ. As this book imagery informs of romantic love, it also helps us anticipate the full consummation of our relationship with Christ when he returns for his bride. Um, this book remains singular within the Old Testament for at least two reasons. Um, its character as a single poem and its subject matter, particularly the frank dis discussion of love between the married couple. The Song of Solomon's willingness to broach the topic of physical love within marriage has been ma made many of its readers throughout history uncomfortable, so much so that Rabbi Ekuba had to vigorously defend the book's place in the Jewish can canon, even as late as AD 90 at the Council of Gymnia. Uh, but as a testament to the beauty of marriage, relationship, and its fullness, Song of Solomon stands out with its uniquely detailed version of this beautiful reality. This totally goes into why my huge question throughout the reading is why Solomon married so many women, if he has kind of love, and this answers it so well. So what caused a man married nearly two decades to begin looking for other wives? Theologians have many main hypotheses. The first hypothesis, and this is going back to what I just read. So if there is, if this guy that I found is reading this passage, right, and if it really was 20 years, so think of that. He had this love with this, with Shulamite for 20 years, and then he marries somebody else, okay? And so this is, again, this is a hypothesis, but I really like it, and it brings me comfort, so we're just going to go on it. Um, the first hypothesis is that Sol Solomon's Egyptian wife had reverted back to idolatry and Solomon, who was still following the Lord at this time, felt that her idol, idol worship made her unfit to be the same city where God's Shekinah glory dwelt. And that's why Solomon sent her to Gazar. Now Solomon brought the daughter of Pharaoh up from the city of David to the house he had built for her. He said, my wife shall not dwell in the house of David, King Israel, because the places to which the ark of the Lord has come are holy, which is interesting. This is a strong case because Solomon's only other reason for making this statement was that she was Egyptian. And this would be contradictory to Deuteronomy 27, 7 through 8, which forbids abhorring, despising or hating Egyptians and allowing third generation Egyptians dwelling in Israel to enter the temple. 
It would also go against the thoughts of Solomon's own temple dedication and his prayer in 1 Kings 8, 41. Did I have somebody read that? I didn't. Um, that, so that's from 1 Kings 8, 41 through 43. This idolatry hypothesis is also seems to be supported by Nehemiah 13, 26, which strongly implies that Solomon was upright with the Lord until he sinned by worshiping idols after marrying foreign wives. The additional fact that while the temple was built, Solomon had a luxurious home built for his wife in 1 Kings 7, 8, lends credence to the possibility that she had reverted to idolatry. Had she been idolatrous at the time, Solomon would not have built a mansion in Jerusalem. And if she had not become idolatrous later, it seemed strange for Solomon to relocate her to Gizar. If Solomon's wife reverted to worshiping the Egyptian gods, perhaps she began to lead him away, or perhaps being separated from her, he became lonely and sought out other women. Given Solomon's eventual penchant for multitudes of wife, why are women? How can we know Solomon wasn't writing a song about lust rather than love in his second Old Testament book? He also wrote Proverbs and toward the end of his life, Ecclesiastes. First of all, we know that all scripture is given by and inspired by God. And that's second Timothy two or sorry, three, eight, meaning that it is God breathed. We also know that the man who wrote scripture were filled with and moved by the Holy Spirit and were called holy men of God, second Peter 1 21. Now it is true that scripture records men and women committing sins. It does not hide this fact, even recorded the sins of kings of Judah and Israel. But this is done in the historical narrative portions of scripture. And it is written in the third person. Song of Solomon written in the first person is not historical narrative, but Hebrew poetry. Therefore, we know that when the Song of Solomon was written by Solomon, it was inspired by the Holy Spirit and that he, what he wrote is profitable for instruction in righteousness. This absolutely means that Solomon was not writing in a lustful spirit, nor was he engaged in any sexual sin. What is written is God's word. Secondly, as he has been shown, Solomon seems to have been faithful to his first and second wife for many years until he grew older and turned to polygamy and idolatry. Thirdly, scholars are fairly confident that Solomon wrote Song of Solomon fairly early on in his reign. We have no reference to the temple, but plenty of references to Lebanon and its cedars. This probably means that Song of Solomon was written no later than during the construction of Solomon's palace sometime before his 13th year of kingship, and most likely much earlier. Song of Solomon 6.8 is not referring to so Solomon's harem, as some uh, theologians claim and use to promote. Instead, it, it may refer to Pharaoh's harem to an entourage attending the wedding. And here Solomon is saying that the women he loves is the most beautiful of them all, and all the members of Pharaoh's royal court acknowledge her beauty. Based on history, we have just traced Solomon had been married to Pharaoh's daughter for a year to several years when he wrote Song of Solomon, with the longest time frame being perhaps a decade, and was devoted to and in love with her alone. It was not until many years later, perhaps when she passed away, that Solomon changed. This is pure and undefiled in Hebrews 13, 4, um, which I did put that there. Can somebody read that? Uh, who took that? Uh, Karen. Um, marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage should bed. I'm sorry, I'm like stumbling. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Okay, so we see that and we see that that is God's plan. So I thought this was a very interesting take. And so to me, like reading this, and if it does work out, and again, this is a, somebody had put this together by scripture and everything. So Solomon was very committed to his first wife, the Shulamite, for at least 20 years, if you look at scripture, if the guy is reading it right. That I do not have time to go and like make sure he's right on that. But I really do like this, like that thought, because um eventually whenever he whenever he did marry Pharaoh's daughter, and whenever he did turn away from um from God, that's whenever he started marrying people more for political. Now he didn't have it, I, I do remember like hearing at one time, he didn't have sex with all of these people that he was married to. Some of it was just a hearsay, hey, we're married because it was more of a political gain. And so um, some of it wasn't like what we think, you know, um, because I mean, there's just no way possible. <laughs> I was like, just, I couldn't have been physically possible. I just can't imagine. So, um, but some of that is in that case, you know, um, so all that to say is I really like this thought and I've never heard of this before. And this is why I like digging into to scripture and seeing things like that, because then you get to see things like this and it's a definitely different perspective. 
Um, and so at this time, whenever he wrote that, yeah, he was completely committed to the Shulamite. Um, and even so, like what my brain has to do is just say at that time he was committed and he was walking with the Lord. <laughs> and we know whenever you turn, whenever you turn, whenever people turn away, you see that this, like, there's a new thing called deconstruction and people are deconstructing. They're turning away from their faith. And it's like a big thing right now. A lot of people are doing, a lot of people who are raising the church are turning away from that and everything. And it's a really sad time. Um, and you just see whenever people do that, you just see their lifestyle. It just, it just changes. And you see that with Solomon. That's what he did. You saw him going down just to such a dark path. You see, we just finished Ecclesiastes. We saw where he was with that. Um, and then he came back um, whenever he, he saw, that's why I like the Ecclesiastes, how it ended, you know? It ended with the same commandments that God said from the very beginning. Um, and so uh, hopefully that's what happened with Solomon too. Okay. Does anybody have anything on that? Because there is a lot on that. Um, and what are your thoughts on that? Is it just a stretch? Is it just trying to make sure to see if like, you know, are we trying to make to, to make it okay? Like, you know, what, what do y'all think? To your point, I think the wife, the multiple wives theory the way I kind of thought of it when you were reading through the different perspectives is, is at that time, like you said, he went from being himself. Then he marries someone from Egypt. Egypt is known as a land of wealth. And we'll just be honest. Women were considered property. We weren't really people. So I almost wonder if the 700 wives and concubines, obviously to the fact that he was astray from God, but it would be like a clout thing, like, hey, I'm important. I have this many wives. And because, I mean, even if you do the math, it's like, what, do you see each wife for half a day for, you know, the entire year? I mean, that, how do you do that? But when you read it like that, that's what came into my mind was like, he went from just being a normal person to be basically a part of the Egyptian line of people that had wealth and worshiped other gods and believed in all those things to where it's like all of a sudden it's like wow dude I'm behind I only have one wife holy smokes I better catch up to where I almost wonder like you're saying I wonder if he did those things because he was so lost and thought well maybe if I get all these wives I'll feel better maybe if I do this I'll feel better to where you said it's like people seem to go like down those paths of being lost but then in the end they circle back to God and be like yeah no this was wrong I shouldn't have done this but people will relate to it because they are maybe lost too but that's what kept popping into my head was it's like I wonder if that's why he did that to that extent you know because sometimes you hear in the bible oh he had five wives he has seven wives he has eight he's like all right well I'll show you you all 700 you know so I wonder if that's part of it too is him trying to make himself look better trying to impress the wrong person which you know he should have been following God but I wonder if that played into it too, the, like too ex the excessive portion of it. I definitely glom onto the whole, uh, all scripture is God breathed and useful for instruction. And I don't have to understand why God used this particular sinner with, to, to write this scripture. I have to ask God to show me what it is he wants to instruct me because we can get wrapped up in all of the theology of it and lose sight of the reality of what is God trying to teach me from it. Yeah, I agree, Laura. And I think that that's why the Song of Solomon, the Tommy Nelson is so good because he doesn't, that's what he does. He just teaches what it, is, what it says, you know, um, and yeah. My husband says Song of Solomon is ideal, but Hosea is reality. <laughs> oh, very good. That's an interesting perspective. That is. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it goes back to exactly that. Like, it, and exactly what this had said in my Bible that we don't question Saul who became Paul. We don't question his, his writing, right? You know, and so I'm so quick to to just judge Solomon so easily. So I'm just so ready to throw him under the bus all the time um, that it's just like, but it is, it's God, it's God breathed. And I do, I do, I do think that churches need to preach on this more. I just do. 
Um, it's due because I think that it's missing. I think it's missing because I think that Christians, the divorce rate in the churches is just as much as outside the church as inside the church. And I think it's because we've lost this. We've lost, we've lost the, the um, preaching of, you know, making sure that a spouse is fulfilling each other's needs and everything. And, and then if you do that, then it's the, Oh, the submissive thing. And then, Oh, you know, and then it just becomes all that battle and everything. That's not it. You see this beautiful couple that have come and you just see their, their, I don't know. It's just, it's, it's fun to watch. It's fun to read. Um, but it's also, it, again, it's like, I, to me, it's like, why do we read any kind of romance novels? Just open it up Song of Songs and you got it. You know, you got the, you got what you need there. So um, yeah, I agree, Laura. And I'm guilty of that. I want to understand everything in the theology and everything else. But I think that goes back to what John MacArthur was saying on that, where, um, you know, read it for what it says, not what you think it says, not what you want it said. And just like Stacey had said earlier, it's like, we read it for what it says. And um, we were actually talking about that last night in family devotion. Um, we were talking about something about that and how people have taken God's word and made it to where what they want to make it. And we can't do that. It says it for what it says. Um, so, okay. Does anybody else have anything on that? Uh, I have something I'll share. Something that you said <clears throat> one time, you probably you might've said it more than once that has always stuck with me about marriage was that it's, and you might have said it earlier in the call that it's meant to make you holy. It's not meant to make you happy. Um, so just speaking to what you said about marriage today and how easy it is for people to throw it away. You know, love is a choice. We choose every single day to wake up and love our spouses. Um, but when I think about Solomon, I think that it's learned behavior. You know, he watched his father do different things, too. Um, so for me, it speaks to generational things, you know, and I don't know if his is more excessive than David's was, but um, that's just what it makes me think of every time. Um, what he should have learned from, he just adapted to and took upon himself, you know. So. Yeah, that's so true, though, because you think his mom was Bathsheba, you know, out of all the people, David learned after Bathsheba and didn't marry after her. You know, I mean, you, you see that David learned, I feel like, like David learned from his mistake after Bathsheba and was like, okay, I'm done. Like, I need to stop marrying these people. Um, and I think, yeah, you would think Solomon would have learned from that, Brittany, <laughs> but he didn't like, um, you know, it is a sense of the father as people say sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you nailed it at the beginning too, with the comment of nobody wants to wait. Everybody, everybody wants everything instantaneously. So I was, well, granted, I was young when I started dating my husband, but we were together 11 years before we got married. You know, we were engaged for a year, but it's like in hindsight, it, it seemed like everybody did everything on fast forward. Like we're going to a wedding in two months. They've already lived together They're They now just bought a house. They've done everything except they're not married yet. And so I thought, well, how, you know, I mean, yeah, it's cool. You're getting married. But then I thought, well, how kind of backwards is that? It's like, well, is it going to be exciting once you actually do that? Because <laughs> you're going to go home to the house you already live in. I mean, I didn't live with my husband until we got married and it was hilarious. We got married. We came back. He happened to, thankfully for me, live right down the street in the apartment, in an apartment. So I just came and I borrowed my dad's cart and I put my things in plastic boxes and I would walk the cart down to the apartment, put my things, come back up, get some things, go back down, put some things. <laughs> and that's where I lived. And then their health at the time wasn't good. So a few years later, I was putting my things in boxes and bringing them back or putting them in storage. And then we moved back here. But, you know, that that whole we'd never lived together. That was exciting for me when we got back from being married. So it was like, you know those kind of things. But yeah, it, it made, when you said that right now, and when Brittany was talking, it made me think about that is that everybody lives on everything on fast forward, or like they call it the microwave society, everybody wants everything instantaneously. So it's like, there is no anticipation, there is no buildup, there is no courtship, for the most part. 
And it's like, I think that's probably why so many things fail is, is people don't wait. They don't get to know anybody long enough before they commit to things to where then all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, I don't even know this person. Well, yeah, because you don't know them. <laughs> so I don't know. That just is, like you said, I think it seems to be kind of a, a lost art that should come back. Because that, like I said, apparently... According to this book here, there's purpose to it. So, you know. Well, I think also not awakening love before. I think that I, I told my girls I had a marriage where I didn't do things God's way, and I had a marriage that where I did the way God intended it. And there's a big difference. Your honeymoon means a different thing, and it just it means a big difference. But not everyone has that. I mean, like that's the thing. I mean, um, you know. Once you become a believer, you see where you messed up if you did, and then you're able to tell others, yeah, you can learn from my mistakes, you know, I mean, and I think that's where grace comes in and we have to forgive ourselves, but also tell other, use that testimony to tell others, you know, um, not to make the same mistake. And I think that that's why it's important. And that's what we see in Song of Solomon. And that's what Tommy Nelson nails so much in his study is wait until you're married, wait until you're married, wait until you're married. But, you know, when you're married, it's really fun, you know, <laughs> so that's what he constantly talks about he's really it really is a great study um okay so we're gonna go to where solomon wrote the book during his reign as king of israel meaning he composed it sometime between 971 and 936 bc scholars who hold to solomon's authorship tend to agree that the song was written early in his reign not merely because of the youthful exuberance of poetry but because his aram of 140 women mentioned in 6 8 is relatively low in number compound to the thousand. I think that in chapter six, I don't think he's talking about his wives. I think he's talking about if you, because I, I actually read that this morning, I think, or yesterday. Um, I think he was talking about whenever he's talking about her being beautiful in other places. I think he was talking about the people there. So that's my thought on that, but I may be wrong. I'm again, I'm not willing to go. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I, I don't know. Um, but I thought this was cool. From courtship to marriage to assurance of love, Song of Solomon poetically presents a broad range of events and feelings in the days leading up to and during marriage, offering encouragement toward an enduring love amid the petty jealous jealousies and fears sure to threaten even the strongest of relationships. We should heed the song's sublime words by continuing to value marriage as one of the bedrocks of society, appreciating the goodness and the beauty born out of the union of two people in holy matrimony. Would you consider your marriage a sign of God's goodness and beauty working in your life, or has it become something less than that over time? Song of Solomon reminds us that both marriage and physical union that follows originate in God. We should therefore consider each of them as evidence of his grace working itself out in the world. Um, practical application, our world is confused about marriage. The prevalence of divorce and modern attempts to redefine marriage stand in glaring contrast to Solomon's song. Marriage says that the bi biblical poet is to be celebrated, enjoyed, and revered. This book provides some practical guidelines for strengthening our marriage. Give your spouse the attention he or she needs. Take the time to truly know your spouse. And courage and praise, not criticism, are vital to a successful relationship. Enjoy each other. Plan some getaways. Be creative, even playful with each other. Delight in God's gift of married love. I personally, well, I'll talk about it. Do whatever it is necessary to reassure your commitment to your spouse. Renew your vows, work through problems, and do not consider divorce as a solution. God intends for both of you to live in a deeply peaceful, secure love. Um, so I know some of y'all are in hardship with marriage. I know sometimes you can't, sometimes your spouse is not a believer. And so I know that those are hard things. I've been there and it's hard. Um, and I know we read this book and then you see that love and that desire. I think that that's whenever it is good to see that this is how Christ loves us. I think it's great to remind ourselves that um, if we're not married, that we have that love in Christ and he loves us unconditionally. He loves us with such a yearning. And I, that is what I held on to after my divorce for sure. Um, I did not plan on getting remarried, did not have any plans. Um, but whenever me and my husband did get married, it was for life. Their divorce was not an option. And that is something that he, we actually gave our testimony in Sunday school on Sunday. And that is something that if you are, but now sometimes you can't control 
when you are in situations that divorce is an option. And that is if, if your spouse is cheating on you, if your spouse is physically abusive, any of those situations, God is a God that if yes, if you can work those out, but the only way you can work through that out is through Christ and through the church coming alongside of you and helping you. Sometimes you can't control the other person. You can't control the other person's behavior. You can't control the other person's outlook. We're, I, we have a friend right now whose husband cheated on her. She tried, she said she would make it work. He was like, no way I'm done. And she can't force him to be with him. I mean, why? And she, she's not going to be in a relationship. And C.S. Lewis's wife actually was married to a man. And he said, well, you can stay in the house with me and this other lady or, and so she wrote C.S. Lewis because they were friends then and was like, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, in that case, scripture is clear. You know, you, you need to leave him. And he, that's not unfair to you and your boys, you know, and that's what she did. She, and then she moved to England and they got married. Um, they have a really interesting story. Um, but so there are situations in that. Um, so I know this lesson may be hard if you're in that situation. And I know because I've been there and I know it's hard. Um, but also know that God is with you. God has gone before you and God is your comfort and um, that he He is always there for us. Um, but for all of uh, like for all of y'all that are married, what are some of the fun and creative things that you do to keep your marriage fun? Keep it clean. Um, but like, I personally think like there is a weekend to remember it's like a getaway weekend. I highly would recommend that. It was awesome. We did that. It's through, what's it through? Um, I don't know, but you go to a really nice hotel family, family life today. Uh, family life today puts on the weekend to remember. Okay. I thought it was, um, I thought it was somebody else, but okay. So is there anything else that y'all like, uh, I watched a movie last night and the couple did date, date, Tuesday, date night thing. And of course it's a movie. So it's like, um, and they, every Tuesday they would go out and they made it. That was like a thing that they did. Um, and so is there anything that you and your spouse do to just make sure to stay connected with one another or anything like that. Um, I also think doing devotion every night together and praying together is important. Um, even if sometimes you fall asleep during prayer, it's still great. So. So I, um, don't do this as often as I should, but something I've heard and I've seen value in when I have done it is, um, you know, especially if you're struggling, uh, to be grateful for, you know, things is to start a journal and, um, write down three things that they did that day that you're grateful, even if it's something small, like whatever they did and then share it with them before bed. And then I even heard the idea of, um, keeping that notebook and give gifting it to them when it's full. Mm -hmm. Um, but as you shift your perspective to look at like what they are doing, it, really empowers the other person to want to rise up even higher um especially if their gifts their love language words of affirmation but um i've seen value in in my marriage when i have done it but again i don't do it as often as i should <laughs> i should so really do that Brittany, because my husband's is words of affirmation that is such a great idea is that like is that from fireproof uh i don't know what it's originally from but i heard it from uh, um like a personal professional development course that I was in. So, yeah, that's a great one. Yeah. We're in a weird season because I live out of a suitcase right now. So I, uh, my husband graciously is okay with the fact that I come and I live with my mom for a good portion of the week and then I come home. So one of the things that I've done is now because I'm very traditional. I do all the cooking, I do all the cleaning, I do the things. So each week when I leave, before I leave, I meal prep so that, you know, he works 10, 12 hour days. I don't expect him to come home and cook for himself because he's tired and it's just as easy. And it's also actually become a good thing because 
I've got so many meals in the freezer that are just for one that it's like, hey, we're not wasting and saving money. <laughs> but each week, it, it's like, an, I don't, it, it just became a thing, but I leave something for him. So whether it's, we got married in Kauai. So now all of a sudden you can get the coffee we bought when we were there. You can get it in the grocery store now. So I would leave him a thing of coffee. I would leave him a little something. So like this week, I happened to go to Costco last weekend and they had that dark chocolate covered blueberry thing in a bag. So I was like, I left him that, but it was just like, just a little something. I just leave it on the counter by where he comes in, you know, but it's, it's like, you don't really talk about it, but it brings me joy to leave him a little something, you know, I don't get to partake in it because it's usually gone by the time I go <laughs> But, you know, it's just, I don't know. It's just like a strange season. I'm still trying to get my head wrapped around it, but it goes back to something. I don't, I don't know. Maybe it is biblical or not, but when we first met each other, one of the first conversations we had was about the fact that we, we need to be friends first and we need to have a solid friendship and Sorry, I didn't expect that to choke me up. Um, when you go through things in life and you have that spouse that's there, like with my dad dying, he was so good. And him and my dad had a bond too. But having that spouse to be there for you or they just kind of let you be but they're always kind of right there like this when you need it. I think that that piece is what's missing from so many people is they're not friends hmm. at all. And like, even my parents, my parents are, were <laughs> the, you could not get like more opposite, but they were really good friends. And I think that that's why it worked. So I don't know, I just, doing those little things, and as a matter of fact, I, uh, he had to work, and I went to make the bed, I had come home, and when I went to make the bed, he bought me a shirt and, and pants, because he had said, he'd heard me watch me folding laundry and said, oh, God, I gotta get a new pair of pants. Well, he paid attention to what pair of pants it was, because he's watched me sew them up three times. He bought a pair for me. Bought him himself. I'm proud of himself. Bought him and had him hidden because he knew I would go make the bed. So it's like those little, I don't know, maybe it is just like a little something, but in the grand scheme of things, you know, I think it's, I think it's, I think people get caught up in the, it has to be this huge gesture. To me, it, it's like just turning the coffee pot on on the weekend to where when I walk out, <laughs> Because he's always up, you know, having your coffee, you know, ready. But I think that, that that those small little things in the grand scheme of things add up. Like Brittany's idea is fantastic. I love that. But. Well, and I think, I think it's important to remember that a good marriage doesn't just happen. It takes effort. <laughs> you know, it doesn't just happen. You, you do. I mean, there are times that... Um, you know, they frustrate you or whatever, but you have to look past those things. And it, you have that with friendships with girlfriends too, where they do things that irritate you or whatever, and you don't just throw it out. You work at those relationships. And so I think a lot of times it, it does take, I mean, you have to think, what can I do for him today to make his life easier? What, what can I do? What, chore whatever you want to say that he normally does can I have done for him so when he comes home we have a little more time together exactly. or we have you know just just when you ask that question Shannon I'm like what do we do but we just we just have so much fun together yeah and it doesn't matter what we're doing we just we want to be together and so even the things that we don't want to do if we're doing them together it just makes it that much better and it wasn't always that way I have to be careful what I'm sharing on here because, because it's recorded. Um, <laughs> yeah, recording so, stop. <laughs> stop the recording, but I do have to go. So. <laughs> stop it anyway. But 
I do. I do agree, Sue. I think it is work. And I think it, I, and again, it's enjoying each other. It's just enjoying that time together. And, and I, I agree. It is team. It's a tag team effort. Sue. I, I love that. Like, that is one thing that my husband's really good at. We're, we just, I don't know. It's like, even after dinner, we have our own things that we do and it's just, it just works and it, it just, it does well. And, and so, um, it was, I don't know. I agree. It is work. And I think that that's, what's missing now. I was at, okay, I'll end with this and I'm going to read Jan's thing and then I'm going to end with this and then I got to go. Um, but I was actually talking to somebody this past week and she's living with her boyfriend pregnant. It was somebody who I counseled. And, um, that's the thing, like the minute it gets hard, they want to run. And, and it kind of goes like was what Stacy was saying. It's like, it, it's going to get hard. And oh. it, there are some days that you just despise them. And I, and it's just like, just don't talk to me. Just don't look at me and just let us survive today. Tomorrow's a new day. And just, you know, going, going <laughs> that, but, um, but it's just staying in it. And, and eventually you do, I think the long, and again, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. The longer you're married, the more you become that oneness. And it just saddens me when I see people married 25, 30 years and they get a divorce. I'm like, are you really wanting to do all that work to start over? That is so much work and invested. Like, I don't understand it. Um, but it is, it's just, um, it is, it's work, but it's, it's beautiful. It's the way God created it. And I think, um, it ends up being beautiful, but okay. Jan said, I had found this when I was researching song of songs and found it interesting song of songs is a well-known, but little understood book of the Bible made up of eight chapters of ancient Israelite love poetry. While there is an introduction and a conclusion, the book doesn't have a rigid literary design. It's a collection of poems that are meant not meant to be dissected, but rather read and enjoyed as a flowing whole. Jan, that is it. That is exactly it. And I told my husband that last night. I said, it, even writing up like the post, and I'm like, it's really hard to just write up posts for this because it is what it says it is. You know, it's kind of like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and that may be with what Solomon is. Is it, it says it what it is, and it's kind of like what Laura had said earlier. It just, it's, it's what it says, you know, there's nothing that you can really say, like, you know, add much to it because it, it says what it is. So, um, I, I agree with that hundred percent. So, okay. I'm going to end with this. Um, I found this from a, uh, uh, commentary and this is where all that scripture that I put in there that has not been read, it is being read right now. And then I really have got to go. We were late again. Let me see if I, it is the Mark. 10 did I put that on there okay I didn't so it'll be the first Corinthians 7 3 the Hebrews 13 4 Proverbs 5 18 and first Thessalonians 4 3 through 5 get those ready and then we're about to read them really fast but scripture is clear that sex is a wonderful gift from God but it is a gift to be used within the bounds of marriage and marriage is designed to be between one man and one woman for life so if somebody reads Mark 10 or sorry I didn't put that one on there so first Corinthians 7 3 or if you have any of Amanda your was going to do it, but I pulled it up for you. First Corinthians seven, three, the husband should give to his wife, her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. Okay. And then Hebrews 13, four. No one got that. Okay. Just go ahead. Proverbs five eighteen. May your fountain be blessed and may you rejoice in the wife of your youth. First uh, Thessalonians four. Laura. Oh, you're muted, Laura. <laughs> Sorry, I thought I clicked it. I, I must have clicked above it. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Okay, so when we examine the above passage, it shows that love expressed in Song of Solomon is at one of devoted married couples expressing their God-given and God-encouraged love for each other. Um, and as they said in Song of Solomon, or 710, I am my beloved's and his desire is towards me. And so just enjoy it. Enjoy this book. Enjoy for, read it for what it says. Enjoy it. Um, enjoy your spouse. And if you are, don't have a spouse, um, again, enjoy the Lord. I mean, and that's the thing I always say before I got married, like just having that time with the Lord is just so it's such a beautiful, precious time too. So 
you get that time too. Um, so does somebody would mind closing us in prayer? I can pray us out. I did want to say um, quick, my husband and I have found in our podunk rural, whatever, there's a gal that comes and she's a Christian and she does dance classes um, once a month for three months in the winter. And we love that. Like in addition to, you know, a snack here or there, or whatever, and everybody else said, but like being physically close to your husband and learning something together in a dance class and our class, we don't switch partners or anything like that. So it's just really nice. It's like a really fun date night for me. I think I enjoy it more than him, but um, it's just really nice. And like, you can tell the difference of like stress beforehand to like just that touching for an hour. It's amazing. Anyway, so that's, that's my thing that we do. But yeah, my, husband and I, my husband and I used to take a uh, ballroom dancing mm -hmm. together. And we it's got so in a competition. We did it for almost five years and we got to be oh, well known. Nice. Yeah, he was fabulous at it. Oh. Yeah, he passed away back in 2012. But anyway, yeah, that was a time that we always went. And then we went to different places and stayed and explored. Mm -hmm. We went and we were in competitions and it was so much fun. And to be known for, you know, how well we did, it was just a lot of good feeling involved in it really cool that's a great we, idea we are not that good but I love that for you that's so special yeah that is Vale. that's really cool it was well I never knew I was that good either until my <laughs> husband said, oh you can do it don't worry about it we're gonna do it and he was <laughs> it, practice at home with him and everything else if, I mean if you have a good lead you can dance really well it makes a massive difference the good it lead makes a massive lead. difference Sure. yeah for sure anyway sorry i just had to throw that one in there that's great okay well, yeah. all right god i thank you so much that we could come together and um meet i just um pray for the health struggles going on that you would just um heal veil and help her to to get back to what she wants to do i pray for the the struggles with relationships and marriages and and things going on as well, Lord, that you would just work in those. And I just thank you for the gift that you've given us of your love and the gift that you've given us of love for each other. And I pray that you would help us to um, remember that as we read Song of Solomon. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all have a good week. You too.